Mi chiamo Julian Robichaud. Come B, altri speakers, non parlo italiano. Buono fortuna con il mio inglese. Then, hmm. so, I, <laughs> so I'm sorry. I am very, very excited to be here. I have never been to Italy before. This is just has been a great conference so far. Uh, thank you all for coming. And my name is Julian Robichaud. I have kind of two slide decks going today. Uh, just a tiny bit about me before we start. Uh, I have a website called NSF Tools. I've done some projects on OpenNTF. I have a Taking Notes podcast that I do with Bruce Elgort, uh, IBM Champion program, and I'm currently a developer for Panagenda. So that's all that I'm going to tell you about me. The rest of this will be about the session, which is about OAuth. Right. So the problem right now is there are just too many logins. It, all of the websites you go to all have their own login. You go to Facebook, you have to log in there. You go to Google, you have a login there. Uh, on IBM, I actually have either four or five or maybe six logins just on IBM.com alone. And it gets very difficult to manage because ideally we would just log in once on our computer and we'd be logged into everywhere. But instead, what happens is we have all of these separate logins all over the place. And that ends up being bad security, too, because for me to remember all of those passwords, then I'll either use the same password everywhere, or I'll start writing things down, or I'll use something where my passwords are stored. So it ends up being bad security to have to log in everywhere like that. So then you ask, why not single sign-on? We have LDAP, and LDAP was supposed to be this great system where there was one central directory and you logged into LDAP and then other web servers or other programs would use your authentication from LDAP to log in. And there are plenty of companies that would love to do that. Google would love for you to only ever log into Google. And Facebook would love for you only to ever log into Facebook. And then you kind of go everywhere from there. But the problem is if I own a website, I don't want my user information to be off somewhere else. I would like to keep my user information for me because I want to send emails and do marketing. And also, if, there's, if you have one account that logs in everywhere, of course, then there's the issue of uh, what happens if someone gets that account. Then there are you all over the place as well. So there's no way to control uh, this kind of global access very easily. Now, one way to do this would be to log into one website and then have that website, give that website your name and password for this website here. So then you can log in here and it will log in here and say, oh, you're Julian, so you're okay to log in and go back. But that's a huge problem too because first you have to trust this website. Suddenly this website is you. And that's not good because you don't ever want to give your password to this website here if you're really logging in here. And then the other way to do that is if you log in over here, then how does this website tell this guy who you are? Well, those are all the problems that they were running into and trying to solve when they made OAuth. So let's do a real world example, just kind of a walk through. This is a story that might kind of help you understand the concept behind OAuth in the first place. So Tony, Tony has a disco. He has a list of people that are allowed to come into his disco. There's his names, all of his friends that can go to the disco. And so when someone comes up to the door, he checks his list and says, yes, you're on my list. You can come in. We also have Frank. Frank has a bar. It's a very cool bar. A lot of people want to go there. And Frank also has a list. And if you want to go into Frank's bar, then you, Frank has to go down his list and say, oh, yes, I know who you are. So you can come into my bar, and everything's great. Well. Frank and Tony got together, and Tony said, you know, I have my list, you have your list. I want the people that come to your bar to be able to come to my disco too, because I like you, I like your friends, and I want to share lists. How does that work? He says that to Frank, Frank says, no. <laughs> it's my list, you can't have my list. So, he has a better idea, and his idea is this they're going to have something called a token. And a token, you can think of a token as a ticket, a piece of paper, something that Tony can give to his people and have his people bring it over to Frank 
And Frank says, yes, this is Tony's token. I know who this person is. I will sign the token and bring it back. So when that happens, then Tony knows Frank's signature. And when they bring back this token, then he says, oh, you know Frank? OK, you can come into my disco. Let's see how this works in real life. Natalie wants to go to the disco. But she's not on Tony's list. Okay. She's a friend of Frank's, and she heard that all of Frank's friends get to come to the disco. So Tony says, OK, I have this token. We just came up with this token idea. And you can take this token over to Frank. And if Frank knows who you are, he will sign it. And you can bring it back. Then you're in. So that's what she does. She goes and brings the token to Frank. Frank checks his list and says, oh, Natalie, I know who you are. I will sign your token. And he puts a timestamp on it. We'll talk about the timestamp in a second. But he, he puts his name. He puts a timestamp. She can go bring that back to Tony and say, here, look, I have the token. Frank knows who I am. I'm on his list. Can you let me in? He says, yes, of course, you can go in. She dances all night, and she's very happy. So, how did all that work? Well, one of the things that happened is they never had to share their lists. And you think of their lists as their logins, okay? So, Tony has his list of logins, names and passwords, for his site, his disco. And Frank has his list of names and passwords for his bar. And they never had to share their lists. They never had to share the lists of users. All they had to do was have that token and that token was trusted. They both knew about that token, and they both knew how the signature worked. And they both trusted each other enough that when Natalie goes and logs in to the bar, because she knows, or Tony knows, Frank knows that she's on his list, and she brings it back, that that's all of the authentication that she had to do. That was the only place she actually had to log in. All right. And they added the timestamp, too. The timestamp is very important. The signature is important because the signature says, yes, you're on Frank's list. The timestamp is very important for security because from a security standpoint, you want to make sure that that token can't necessarily be reused. So the timestamp means that she is on Frank's list now, so not six months ago when then maybe she did something bad, and he kicked her off the list. So she is currently on that. And also that it can time out. So with that timestamp, then maybe that timestamp is only good for 30 minutes, or maybe it's only good for one day or something like that. So the token can be used, and it can be used for a very short amount of time. After that, you have to go and get another token with another timestamp on it. All right, so what does this have to do with OAuth? Because really, we're here talking about OAuth. Well, OAuth, anytime you go to a website and it says, you can log into my website, or you can log in using Google, or Yahoo, or Twitter, or Facebook, or whatever, that is almost always using OAuth in the back end to establish that trust relationship between the, the websites. And we will see how this works. So in the story, we had Natalie and Tony and Frank. Uh, when you read about OAuth and you go through the OAuth documentation, then you have what's, what's called a user, which is going to be Natalie in our story. You have a consumer, which is the website that you want to log into, uh, but you can't because you don't have a password there. And in that case, that was the disco. And then you have a service provider. The service provider is where you are actually on the list. All right, so the first thing that happens is way before the user ever comes and tries to visit this site or go into the bar or go into the disco, then the consumer and the service provider, these two websites, have already set up a token between them. So they, did the, they set up a token way before anyone ever tried to log in. Now, after that's happened, when any user goes to the website and they click that button that says, I want to log in with Google, or I want to log in with Facebook, or something like that. So 
you'll have a screen like this. You'll click a button instead of actually logging in. Then what happens is in the background, that website in the middle, the consumer, it sends you some token information back to your browser. So it can do that in, in any number of ways. You never actually see that. But it sends some information back to your browser and tells your browser, OK, you have this information. Bring this information over to the service provider. And you need to log in over here. So the token is kind of being passed in the background. And that's where, in real life, or on the web, on the internet, where you end up on Twitter or Facebook, and either you're already logged in, or you log in there and it says, are you sure you want to let this other website access your information? Or are you sure that uh, you, know, you trust this other website, or you want the website to know who you are? Once you do that, once you sign in and you click OK, then in the background again, your browser gets the sign token sent back to you, along with the, OK, we're done, you're authenticated, you can go back to whatever site that was you were in the first place. Then you end up back at the site that you started out at, right? So you end up at the consumer site, and you have your token with you, and you give that token back to the consumer website with the, sign, the signature and the timestamp. And once, now at this point, you might be done. Maybe all you want to do is authenticate. And that's fine. So that's one of the things that OAuth can do. OAuth can simply say, yes, this is Julian, or this is Natalie, or this is whoever. I know who they are. They are on my list. And, and you're done. Um, or the other thing that you can do on top of that, besides just saying, I know who you are, is you can also potentially access information. And if the website also needs to access information from the service provider, then it has to get a second token. And that's part of the security, because just having that first token, that first token is being passed around by your browser. And you know, having your browser pass information back and forth to a website is not always the most secure thing. So there can be things that go on in the background between those two servers where if they need to get information, so when you actually logged in and said, yes, it's OK to, for uh, Twitter to be my password site, that's the list I'm on, it will tell you. It, it says here, re, the application will be able to read tweets. It will be able to see who you follow. It will not be able to do those other things. So in, o, in order for this consumer to be able to get that information that you've allowed it to get, it has to use something called an access token in the back end. And so that's where the information is passed. Now, for Twitter, it might be that it can access your tweets. If it's Google, then maybe it can access your email. Maybe not. Maybe it can access your pictures. Uh, maybe it can access your blog or something. And so it's not all or nothing. And that's one of the important things about OAuth, too, is once you've authenticated, it's not like that first site can get all of your information. Because I have a lot of stuff on Google. I mean, on Google, I've got documents. I've got email. I've got uh, uh, payment information. I have a wallet. I have all sorts of things. And so I want to make sure that just because I let this one website log me in with Google, that doesn't mean that website can get everything. And there are some technologies that are like that. Uh, so OAuth was designed so that you can define when they set up the token that, oh, you can only get this one little piece of information. Maybe it can only, again, maybe it only knows who I am. Or maybe it can only get my contact list because it wants to send emails to everyone I know. I don't know. But that's one of the important things about OAuth because it's not you don't get access to everything. You just get access to very certain things or very certain pieces of data. And after you're done, you're authorized, and you have the token. So the tokens can be used to move around just like you actually logged in to the consumer in the first place. So some of the goals here, some of the things that they did to try to make authentication better. So first of all, we're never sharing the passwords. And that was a very, very important piece of OAuth when they designed it. You're never sharing, this website never shares a password with that website because it's very insecure. And you can't trust that this website won't take your password and run away and do something bad with it. Also, the access should be limited. So there's only a certain amount of time that the token is good for. There's only a certain amount of data 
that the one website will be able to get from the other website. And also, you can revoke the access at any time, too. So here, if you go to the issued auth sub tokens page on Google, there's a button in your Google account, and it will show you all of the websites that you've logged into clicking login with Google and that you've trusted with that. It shows what information you've allowed that website to get. And it also has a button that says revoke access. So at any time, you can go back to Google, which you're on the list for Google. You can always go back there and say, you know what? I don't want TripIt to be able to use Google anymore. I, cut that connection. You know, we will no longer allow TripIt to access my information using Google when I log in and click log in with Google. Um, you can re-authenticate, so you can always click the button and make it happen again. But you as the user, since this is your account, you can always just take that right back away. So it's not forever. All right. And then another important piece of this is how does that token go back and forth? And there's a couple of different ways. It kind of depends on the website that is doing OAuth. So some of the websites that do OAuth will use a URL query string. So up here you see you have the link and then it says OAuth token equals SQGZ6K, something like that. So sometimes it will pass token information on the query string like that. Sometimes it will use a post request. So, uh, you know, kind of along with a cookie or something like that, it will be sent to the website and it will be sent back to you. You never really see that token information, though. Your browser is doing something to kind of hide that. But because all of that still has to go over the wire, then you always want to make sure you're using HTTPS. It's very, very important uh, that when you're looking up here at the URL that you end up at when you log in, make sure that's HTTPS because you don't really want someone to be kind of capturing that traffic. All right, as far as the security goes, one of the things you have to do is you just kind of have to trust that the security works. It's, there's cryptography, there's some public key cryptography, so the same kind that you're using with RSA, HTTPS, PGP, that sort of thing. There's some of that security in there. There's hashing. You kind of have to just trust that the cryptography works on some level. You have to say, okay, they were smart people who figured this out, and it will not be easily, uh, uh, easily cracked. And you do that every day anyway. Every time you go to a website that says HTTPS, you're kind of trusting that, yeah, the guys who did the security, they knew what they were doing. They did it in such a way that uh, people will not easily be able to crack it. Um, so that's part of it. Part of it is that we have the two different kinds of tokens, right? So we have the request token that goes back and forth the first time. Then you have an access token that actually gets the data, if it can get data from your account. They use something called nonces, which is numbers used once. So you can't, it, one of the things they worry about is something called a replay attack. So let's say that you've got your token, it's all signed, you have it, and then someone comes and grabs that token and starts using it somewhere else. Uh, so some of the cryptography they use uh, make sure that, uh, that it's unique to that session. Uh, and of course they have the timeouts, they have the stopwatch, they have uh, the concept that you're never sharing the user information with the token, Okay, so when it sends the token back and forth, it doesn't send a token back and say, oh, by the way, this was Julian, and here's all Julian's information. That doesn't come back with the token. That's completely separate. Um, so the token is just, is used as the key to unlock something on the server end. So the history, this has been around since 2006. So it's had a long time. They took several years to, to bring OAuth to the point that they felt like it was secure, that uh, websites that were using it said, yes, we feel comfortable using it, and they changed a lot of things along the way. So really between 2006 and 2010, they did a lot of things to make it better, make it easier, make it safer. Uh, and so as of 2010, it was an internet RFC, and a lot of people have started using it since then. Uh, OAuth 2.0 is something they've been working on for years. And it keeps being almost ready. 
And I don't know when OAuth 2 will finally be ready because people are using it. So Facebook uh, really likes to use OAuth 2. Uh, with Google, you can still use OAuth 1, but OAuth 2, which is, again, it has some additional processes, uh, then Google says, yeah, you can still use OAuth 1, but we'd really prefer that you use 2. Uh, but I, sites all over the internet are, are using this because it's just so easy. And once you have the libraries that allow you to do OAuth and to make the connections and things like that, then it's very easy to stick a button on your web page that says log in with Google and log in with Twitter because all you have to do is, is set up an account uh, from your website to the website that has OAuth and then you can put the button on here and it, the libraries on the server will handle all the hard things for you. So OAuth 2.0, again, that's kind of coming out and some people are using it, they're very happy with it. There's a lot, a, a lot of things they did to improve it for especially mobile devices. So if you try to make an iPhone app that uses OAuth 1, it's actually kind of difficult because there's so many back and forth that the way that the redirection works to go back and forth between the first website, then back to your browser, and then to the second website, then back and back to the first one. Um, iPhones don't like that too much when you're doing a native app. Uh, and you can, you can make it work, but it's kind of difficult. Uh, they've got some, some nicer flows than, than we were using when we did the, the example before. Uh, things that make it easier for things like gaming systems. Uh, so they're talking about using OAuth 2 maybe on an Xbox or something uh, so that when you're logging into your gaming system, you can log in somewhere else securely. And again, that's a little bit different. So they use sort of different keys and different methods of uh, passing the tokens uh, that way. And, and apparently it's easier to, to scale it because one of the things they have to worry about is if you're in an environment where you have multiple servers, then the servers have a hard time kind of keeping up with, well, I logged in over here, so I should be logged in here too. Uh, also, the tokens are refreshable. Uh, so another problem that you might run into with OAuth 1 is if you're downloading a really, really big file. So let's say that you're on a fairly slow network connection and you go and get a token that's good for 15 minutes. And after 15 minutes, then your browser will generally automatically uh, go and get another token. It will kind of keep you logged in in the background, or it might not, it might make you log in. But after 15 minutes is up, let's say that your token is good for 15 minutes, but you're downloading a file that is 20 gigabytes. Well, that file might take 30 minutes to download. Halfway through your 30 minute download, your token runs out and you're logged out of the site, and then what happens? Um, so OAuth 2 actually can handle that a little bit better in terms of refreshing the token you have. But anyway, it's better, I guess, somehow. On Lotus Domino, uh, there are two very, very smart guys that have implemented OAuth and have actually uh, got it set up so that uh, they took some standard OAuth libraries, integrated that with X pages and gave a lot of examples and custom controls so that uh, you can handle the token storage very securely. And apparently that's very hard to do. Um, you know, with the token, you have these, these numbers that we're gonna see in a second. And to keep those numbers securely stored in a database or somewhere else is not as easy as you would think because you don't want someone else going and grabbing your keys and saying, oh, well, I can, I can use this key and I can pretend like I am someone's server. Uh, so they did a lot of work in terms of making this fairly secure. Uh, they also have an uh, open source. It used to be on socialenabler.openntf.org, but now it's actually part of the, what is it, the ext lib, so the xpages extension library. Um, and this is the one that you download, so not necessarily what you're gonna have on your server. Uh, but if you download the extension library now, uh, there are a couple of files, and there's a lot of files in the extension library because the extension library does more than just OAuth. It has a lot of custom controls, it has all sorts of plugins, but there are three things. The plugins themselves, if you install all of the plugins, you'll get the OAuth plugin on your server. Uh, there's the web security store database template so that you can manage all of your tokens and manage the information securely and make sure that when users kind of uh, log in that they're logging in as themselves and not as someone else. Uh, and there's something called the Xpages SBT database, and that is for Social Business Toolkit, 
because that used to be called the Social Business Toolkit, and I guess it still is. And that has a lot of examples for accessing not only some public sites like Dropbox and Facebook and Twitter, but also Lotus Live connections. Uh, and so it has some good integration uh, between this Domino database and an X page and these other websites or other servers that are sitting somewhere else. And we will actually go through an example of Dropbox here in a second. But they did all the hard work for you. And, and you know, certainly you wouldn't just take their example and say, oh, here you go, give it to your users. But it's all open source. Uh, it has custom controls you can reuse. And the control ends up working kind of like a view, which we'll see that in a second too, which is really nice. Uh, so if you're familiar with X pages and you've done anything with views and those kinds of controls, then it will be very natural um, for you. So setting up the toolkit. Um, I have a whole nother section of this slide. I don't know if we're going to have time to go through it, and even if we do, it's kind of boring. <laughs> so uh, we'll see. But as part of the slide deck, if we don't have time to go through Appendix A <laughs> of this slide deck, which is several slides, I give you all of the instructions for getting this set up. So I I I'm not necessarily going to go through the setup one by one by one with you of how to set up the extension library and how to um, how to sign a template and how to create a new database because you know how to do that. Um, but all of the information is here in the slide deck. So after you get done, you should be able to go through all of those slides and go step by step and it's about 20 steps or so uh, to get it all set up on your server so that you can test it out as well. But basically what you have to do is you have to have a Domino 853 server. I think technically it might work on 852, but they say 853. Um, so you need that. You have to create an update site for the ext lib plugins, the extension library, if you haven't done that already. And you have to create the web security store for the tokens. And then you have to um, just pretty much copy that social business toolkit database somewhere. You should sign it, but you just kind of have to copy it. You don't really even have to set that up because it, it's set up by default to be able to use the plugins that are already there. And it's set up by default to already use the web security store database. So let me switch over and show you how this works. All right. Um, so I kind of struggled between whether I was going to do this live and then maybe it breaks because the network doesn't work or uh, just do kind of a screen cam. So I actually uh, took a screen capture of myself doing this yesterday. Uh, just in case the internet didn't work, and also so I can kind of talk through it uh, and stop it and pause it and, and let you know what's going on. Because the first thing you have to do is uh, go to Dropbox. So in our example, we're going to Dropbox. And Dropbox, once you have a Dropbox account, you can go to this developers uh, section of Dropbox. And that gives you all sorts of information about the APIs, um, how to use the APIs with REST, and how to do development for Dropbox. Um, and this is how we're going to hook into OAuth because when you create an app on Dropbox, then the Dropbox app is where you're going to set up all of your keys for the tokens. So you just have to kind of go to My Apps and create a new app. Pretty straightforward, very simple. Um, the name doesn't really matter. That's just something we're going to see here in a second in terms of when the person logs in. They will see the name that you actually put down. Um, but the, the only kind of part that might not be intuitive is make sure it's full Dropbox. Because if you set this up as app folder, um, then I found out that it doesn't work. Uh, just, and, and you can make it work, but the code that comes out of the box with the Social Business Toolkit, it doesn't work unless you set it up as full Dropbox. But when you do that, then suddenly you have this app profile. And this app profile has the key and the secret. And those are the things that are used to actually generate the token in the background. So it's not truly the token itself, but they can be used um, along with just a little bit of cryptography and uh, some secret numbers to, to generate a token so that we can do that little OAuth dance that we were talking about where it bounces back and forth. Um, so once you set that up, just make sure you take those and copy them somewhere because you're going to need them here in a second uh, when you set up your, uh, your web security store. So in this case, I just kind of took it and I copied and pasted it to Notepad because everyone in the world still uses Notepad. And once you do that, then, you, then on my server, I've already copied over 
all of the uh, extension library plugins. I've already set up the, uh, the web security store here. Um, so right now we're at the web security store and you go to application keys, so we're gonna add a key. And the key is just, in this case, in other words, you were talking about OAuth tokens, then, then that's what we'd mean when we say t keys. So we have to create a token and the way the social business toolkit is set up by default you actually do need to use XPages, SBT, and Dropbox. Again, you can change that. There's a configuration you can change, but if you want it to work just out of the box, then make sure you use XPages, SBT, and Dropbox. Um, after you've done that, then you go back and take those things that we copied and pasted before, and the app key gets pasted where it says key, and the secret gets pasted where it says secret. Uh, another thing that might not be obvious is the encryption type. Uh, so the encryption type is just the encryption that is used when it's creating the token in the first place. So in this case, it needs to be that, HMAC, SHA1. So it's going to hash uh, the information that you send to it. Um, and then you have all of these URLs. And these URLs are used when it's kind of bouncing back and forth to take the token in the first place, give the token here. It needs to get an access token, so it has to go somewhere. Um, I actually knew where those were because uh, in the appendix slides, it does tell you what those, uh, what those URLs are and also where to get it. So it's on the Dropbox site where it just says, oh, you need to set up OAuth, use this URL, this URL, this URL. So it's not something that's gonna be the same for every website, of course. Uh, so you do have to look it up. And that's the only thing that might not be obvious when you set up uh, OAuth with, say, Google or Twitter or something like that. You have to know what those URLs are. Um, once you have those, you click OK, and we've actually generated something that can create a token now. Um, and I think here I just click on it one time real quick just to make sure, yes, it actually did work. Because one time I went through all of that and everything was blank. So I did something wrong. So it's good to check, good to make sure. Um, and what I did here is I switched over, so I switched tabs from the, the place where my OAuth tokens are to the social business toolkit. Um, so now it's called the XPages Social Enabler. And this is where all the examples are. So all I did with this database is I just copied it to the server and signed it, and that was pretty much it. Um, and it's got all these examples here. So it's got the example for IBM Connections for same time, Social Business Toolkit, Lotus Live, uh, Dropbox. And so uh, what's nice is that, again, it's open source, so you can go in there and you can see how these controls work. And you can go and look at the plugins and see how the plugins are kind of talking back and forth. Um, as a matter of fact, Frank, you did, um, I, I think you've got a whole session, right, on connecting this to, was it connections? Activity stream, Activity stream right, right. And so, um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of really good code in here that you can take and you can sort of just change a little bit here and there and, and do something besides just Dropbox or you can integrate this with one of your other applications. Um, so here, what I'm doing is when I click on Dropbox, when I click on that tab, then in the background, it's going to be going to Dropbox and it's gonna log me in with this token. So it's gonna send the token um, over to Dropbox. And uh, you'll see that I'm already logged in. It tells me I'm logged in. So it says you're currently logged in as Julian. If you don't wanna be Julian, then log out and log back in again. Um, but whoever you are, then this is what it's going to have access to. And again, this is kind of an important piece of OAuth where it says this app will have access to your entire Dropbox. So you know, first of all, that my app called OAuth Test for Domino Point, and remember when I set up the name before, that name shows up right here so you can see exactly what application is trying to log into Dropbox. But it also tells you exactly what information it's trying to get. So at this point, I might look and say, it's got access to my whole Dropbox? No, I'm not gonna do that. And you know, I do that all the time with sites that want me to log in with Twitter or Facebook. Like you'll click log in with Facebook and then it will say, this application will have the ability to post things for you on Facebook and delete your pictures and, uh, and pretend it's you and change your password. And I say, no, I don't want it to do that. So it's nice because, oh, that's part of, it's built into the protocol. So OAuth kind of says that you, you need to make sure that the users know what information that this application has access to. And again, it's really nice because it's not all or nothing. So some of the, the older single sign-on 
um, technologies, you didn't have that kind of control. And it was, once you're logged in, you're logged in, it can do anything. And OAuth is very granular as far as that goes. So anyway, as Julian, since I know who I'm logged in as, I'm already logged in, so I don't have to type my name and password, you just click Allow. And once you click Allow, then that way back in Dropbox, Dropbox says, oh, okay, well, this application is allowed to use this token to get the information. And once it's done that, it sends the token back, and there's a custom control on this X page that works just like a view that has gone back, taken my token, traded it for an access token, so that it can get the information from Dropbox, and then it pulls in the, in the back end uh, the information from my Dropbox folders and shows it like a view in Notes. That's all. I mean, that's, that really wasn't that hard because someone else has written all the code. Someone's written the libraries that do the hard stuff in terms of taking the keys and signing them and hashing them and tracing them back and forth. So all you have to do is you need to go to Dropbox and get your keys put the keys into this database, this token database, and then set up the custom control that is automatically pointing back over to the, um, uh, to the, the token database, and everything can be managed from there. So here, again, that's my whole Dropbox for this account. So because this works just like a view, I can click down into it, so I can click on that folder, go into my apps folder, I, can I have some files in here, so I can click on the test files and I can get the files back. Um, I can open the files, I can delete things. So that's all API on the back end. Again, um, the, Nicholas and, and Phil did a great job uh, kind of getting that code together for you, so you just have to click a couple of buttons. But it's using OAuth in the back end to make sure that you are who you, you're supposed to be and that you have access to do that in the first place. And then there's just API calls that are being called on the back end. There's also this thing called the OAuth dance. And that's just a term that people use when they talk about the tokens going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Uh, between the websites. They call that the OAuth dance. And so if, you're, if you really are wondering kind of what's going on in the background and what information is going back and forth, they've also put that tab up here so that, um, so that you can see uh, you know, the secret, the key. You can uh, look a little bit later on about how some of this stuff got, um, got hashed. Uh, so if you scroll down, but th this is information you would never show a user, right? I mean, the user should never really see this, but since this is kind of an example and a good demo uh, that they did for us, then you can see uh, you know, some expiration dates. So this one does not have an expiration date. Uh, the secret uh, is something that, that's very important, and you can clear that out too. So if I go and I clear that token out, then the next time I try to click a folder in Dropbox, then it will make me log in again because it wants to get a new token. You can also force the tokens to time out. So this is also good for just testing to make sure it works the way you think it does. Um, and beyond that, again, in this database, it has uh, plenty of other things for Lotus Live, Twitter. Uh, if you need to manage the user keys, then you know we had the, the keys before from Dropbox that created the token. If you actually wanna see the tokens, then here's the one for Julian that I just logged in with. I can look at the information, I can also delete it and clear it out, so I can force myself to log in again that way too. Um, but what this database ends up being is it's not really a password store database, but it's a database that holds secure information so that users can log in somewhere. So you really wanna make sure this database is really locked down. And they have things, they've got readers field, it's got updated by, but it's also gonna have some readers and authors fields that you might wanna kinda of mess with just to make sure that only I can see my token and not anyone can because otherwise people could just be me. Um, but they actually, again, spent a lot of time trying to make this as secure as possible as well. So that's what my token ended up looking like and that's what's being used in the back end uh, to go and connect and, and uh, authenticate me with Dropbox. Um, so that's pretty much how it works on the Domino server. Um, if you want more information about OAuth in general, then I got a bunch of links for you. And uh, I'm not sure that any one of these links is better than the other, but these are just some, some things that I've used either in the past or when I was putting the information together. And this is sort of OAuth in general. 
there's some, some slides up there too. Uh, Lotus specific kinds of things. Obviously the extension library is something you're going to want to download right away and start using if you want to see an example of Nicholas actually going through some of this with the Social Business Toolkit, which is what ended up being the extension library. He did a YouTube video that was really good. There were two sessions at Lotusphere. If you have uh, access to the Lotusphere slides, then there are AD 104 and 105 dealt with uh, not just OAuth, but sort of this whole social business concept in the first place. Uh, Matt White also did something where he broke down how Facebook OAuth works, but not using a lot of libraries. Like you can see line by line where he's getting the information, how he's transfor transforming it uh, and signing it, and how he's sending the tokens back and forth. And so that's actually a really good example too, uh, because normally you're gonna end up using a library to take care of OAuth for you, but Matt White did a nice job of saying, I'm not gonna use a library at all. I'm just gonna go step by step and make all of this stuff work. Um, and so otherwise, Appendix A, um, I'm not gonna go through this, but this is all of the information you will need in order to set this up on your server. It looks sort of like a lot, but it's really not. Um, it's just, I wanted to make sure it was as step by step by step as, as it can be because there's a couple of things that can kind of trip you up, um, especially if you wanna change any of the defaults. So it's great that all of the, uh, the social business toolkit and the EXT library things work out of the box. But if you want to put it in production, then generally you're going to change that somehow. Uh, so it's not always obvious where the information is. In this case, it's the facesconfig.xml file in the database, and that's where you would change where the token database is, what it's called, uh, some things like that. And also, I've had some problems you know, doing testing for this. I'm constantly creating a token, deleting a token, changing my app IDs, changing my secrets, and moving things around in the server. A lot of times, unfortunately, the way, at least the way I have it set up, I had to restart the server. The server was remembering some of the old um, uh, app access information. So be careful with that. Once you have it set up, it works just fine. But when you're setting it up, if you're deleting a lot of things and moving things around, every once in a while the server will remember something old. And it's not always obvious that it does. Um, there's also the, uh, the extension library book, and I don't know if any of you have seen that. If you are an XPages developer, then this book has some fantastic information in it. Uh, I've got that as an ebook. They have a whole chapter on sort of social business toolkit kinds of things. So they go into more detail about the custom controls. So if you want to find out how these custom controls work a little bit more under the covers, then they've got that. And of course, there's plenty of other really good information in that book. Um, other than that, uh, I'm Julian Robichaud. I hope that was useful. Um, I hope that even if, it, if, even if some of that didn't make sense right now when I was talking about it, that you will be able to take the slides and go through and, and it will make sense when you go through it again or when you're putting it on your server. If it doesn't make sense at all, that's my email address. Uh, and at Pan Agenda, we're pretty good about routing, uh, I guess, things that aren't spelled quite right because my name is kind of hard to spell. So, uh, but that's my email address. Other than that, uh, this has been a really fun conference for me. Uh, I, I hope that it's, it's been a lot of fun for you. Uh, so happy I got to come up here and give the presentation and see all of you. And uh, thank you. Grazie.